Welcome to Catching the Light, your daily Bible study. Join us as we discuss God's unchanging truth and show how it can be applied in our day-to-day lives. And now, here's your host, Kip Bradford on Catching the Light. Hello and welcome to this episode of Catching the Light. Uh, Last time we had talked about the parable of the workers and had a a wonderful conversation there. And at the end, after I closed, I realized that Chuck had one more comment to make, which is a really appropriate comment. So what we're going to do today is we're going to have prayer and then we are going to have your comment. Then we're going to have the feel good story of the day. And then we're going to get to uh, chapter 20, starting in verse 17. So Sean, would you start with prayer with us? Dear Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for this time we could spend in your word. Thank you, Father, for the Holy Spirit that just teaches our minds. And Father, I just uh, ask that the Spirit would be poured out on each one of us. And uh, may we be a blessing and receive a blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Actually, I want to change that. I'm going to do the feel-good story of the day, and that'll flow into all of us. There you go. So anyway, um, do you like children? I know you were talking about uh, your granddaughter you do frequently, Mm -hmm. uh, and that isn't annoying. So just so you know, it's not (laughs) annoying. (laughs) She seems, I I, I don't know that I've met your granddaughter, but when you tell Mm -hmm. the story, she just seems like she's funnier than anything. (laughs) She is. And if you're funny, I'm, you know, you're in, you're, you can come play with me any day. So, um, uh, so this the, today's feel good story is about a a group of children at a school in Hillsburg, California, who um, recognizing and in the last episode we talked a, a little bit about how as we come out of of COVID and we've lost relationship and we have people who are depressed and, and more so than than their natural uh, inclinations toward depression. Um, that we live in a time where people need to have words of encouragement uh, on many levels. Right. And so this little grade school, they, they put together a hotline and I'll read the hotline number to you. So those of who who are watching right now could read this, uh, call this number. And the number is, I'm going to turn off my phone. It's dinging. Um, Mm -hmm. there we go. Uh, I wondered where that was coming from. I thought it was Jeanette. Um, is 707-998-8410, 707-998-8410. And what these children did is it's fun to listen to children's recorded voices and mm. the things that children say. In fact, you told us that uh, your your granddaughter, when you're going to race, you know, one, two, three, go, that, that what, you have to have four. Yeah, she says it has to be four. It has it can't to be, be just four. three. We always think three. about it be one, two, three, go. But no, she says it has to be four before you say go. Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so children say cute things. And they pre-recorded words of encouragement from these children. And when you call up, you will have uh, the little uh, tree thing. And it says something like, um, if you would like to hear uh, encouragement, press one. If you would like to hear advice from a kindergartner, press two. You know? <laughs> <That's cute. laughs> Whatever. Um, and so when they've got the number, my wife and Jeanette, uh, our producer, uh, called every number and called, listened to every message. And one lady said that when she was listening to the messages uh, that was at one of the schools, uh, uh, was one of the secretaries, They, she was observed crying mm-hmm. that the words from these children were so meaningful. We have uh, the ability to let our children speak to us if we'll stop and listen. You know, they're, they're are organic, they're, 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 their comments are pure. Um, sometimes they're purely annoying. Sometimes they're purely uh, wrong, in, but, they, but they are honest. Um, and so, uh, my, my, um, brother wanted to be an evangelist when he was just a little kid and I was littler to him, of course. And, uh, he went and got all the children in the, in the neighborhood together to come to our garage and got my dad's slides out that he used at his evangelistic cause my dad was an evangelist and, and, and preached revelation to a room full of kids from the neighborhood. And I ran the projector with the beasts and all of that. <laughs> and there was one little boy that got baptized. Oh, and that little boy, when I got to high school, was still active in the church. Mm. So uh, don't discount your children. They can mm. lead people to the Lord. And mm. um, anyway, so I, I love this story. The hotline, and it's called Pepco, uh, uh, a pep talk, not Pepco, pep talk. Uh, and it's spelt P E P 
P-T-O-C, because that's the way one of the little boys spelt pep talk. <laughs> <laughs> and so they kept that. So what a wonderful little story. Yeah. Uh, let's continue uh, with Matthew. And at the end of Matthew chapter uh, 20, verse 16, the last, the last will be first and the first will be last. For many are called, but few chosen. And Chuck wanted to address that uh, at the end of our last program, and I just didn't give you time. It's okay, no. We have a good conversation. Good, good thoughts were being shared. So, but, yeah, I just want to bring that up because I know some people will think many are called, but few are chosen. I mean, God only chooses a few people and stuff? Well, it's predestination. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's what you would think out of this verse, you know. But as uh, we were talking a bit after the last program, as Sean brought out, that, you know, God chooses those who choose him. And that's what it's really saying. Few are chosen— it's not because God only wants to bring a few. God, the Bible tells us that God would, is willing that all should be saved. So it, it's not that God only chooses a few. It's just the fact that only a few are chosen because they, there's only a few that choose him. So mm-hmm. there, There's no limit to the number of people God will have on his team. Amen. So when I, when I think of chosen, I was not a particularly athletic young man. Uh, I'm still not. You know, I play pickleball and hurt myself and, you know. <laughs> Um, but I used to dread at grade school when we would go to recess and we would pick teams because I was usually, you know, in the last couple of people picked, you know, and I'm sitting there in my, in my, um, childness thinking, pick me, pick me, pick me, pick me. So I'm not the last one to pick. Not that I desired to play kickball that bad. I just didn't want to be the last one picked. Um, but God picks us all. And then we just don't always respond. Right. I mean, in first John chapter four, it says that God does. No, that's not the right verse uh, that God desires all men to be saved, all, all of humanity to be saved. So God's already picked everyone. It's just our responsibility to respond to it. And, and I think that in, in your case, um, and, and this is sort of going back to the uh, previous program, but um, it doesn't matter where you got picked on the team. Guess what? You're on the team. And so the fact that you're on God's team, it doesn't matter when you're picked uh, because God says, um, you've chosen me. I called you already. And he's just like, okay, everybody come on in regardless. You know, in the parable of the one talent, two talents, five talents, that sort of thing. God's saying, everybody has something to bring to the table. And I don't care whether you have one, two or five. Um, I just care that you've chosen to be on my team. And... The way God's government is set up, number one, is when you're picked to be on God's team, he's not going to stick you out in right field. Right. <laughs> yeah. It seems like that was the same thing for all areas. I was in Chicago area, so you're in California, and yet everybody knew that the weakest players play in right field. Yeah, right? Exactly. Right. <laughs> That's right. Uh, the other thing is, is that if in God's government, if I'm out in right field, number one, I won't care. And number one, I won't know. Right. Because everyone is more important than I am. Mm-hmm. And so the so so in God's government, the star player, the best player on the baseball team will say, No, put me out in right field. Speaking of star, the- I want Chuck to have fun <laughs> at third base, which is my favorite position. Oh, okay. Speaking of star, there's there's uh there's one the statement that that I remember that that it says that uh stars represent souls that you've you know brought to to the Lord. And, and, uh, so it says many are just there's there of their crowns were weighty with stars and some had just a few, but all were perfectly satisfied with their crowns. And so the, the idea of, you know, whether, whether it's many or few, everybody was just perfectly satisfied. Mm -hmm. And of course God was too. Sure. And in in revelation, uh, chapter three, uh, I think is verse 20, 21 says, you know, Come sit with me. And for those who have overcome, sit with me on my throne. So so it's going to be an enormous throne. That's a big one. <laughs> you know? But here, Jesus did everything, and he deserves the throne he has. We did something be, only because of him working in us. No, Jesus did everything. We did something. And that something is still what Jesus did. So mm-hmm. we did nothing, really, if you want to get, get real brutal about it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then he says, and come sit with me on my throne. It's just amazing to think that, like you said, Jesus does everything working through us. All our work is to do is to be willing to receive what he wants to do through us Mm -hmm. and say yes to him because he's not going to do it against our will. And then yet he says, come in to this place I prepared for you, you thou good and faithful servant. Like 
I'm, I'm, you're the one that's so faithful and good. I'm just responding right. to your goodness and faithfulness. And who's he saying that to? As we tie up the rest of verse, the, the, the first part of 20, he's saying that to the one that showed up to work at 6 o'clock mm-hmm. in the morning. He's saying the one that showed up to work at 5 o'clock in the morning. Mm-hmm. He's say, showing the, 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 the thief on the cross, the mm-hmm. deathbed conversion, who did absolutely nothing for the cause of Christ, except he did an enormous thing for the cause of Christ. Mm-hmm. What he did is he accepted Jesus, and Jesus said, that's one more. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's one more. Right. Mm -hmm. It's not always we want to make it all about our effort to convert. Mm -hmm. Now, our effort to convert is is not an effort because it's Christ working through me. Mm -hmm. Um, But but to God, it's it's like, you know what? (laughs) Just one more. Just Mm -hmm. one more. Mm -hmm. And and my throne's big enough for them all. And so our effort then is to point them to Jesus and then let Jesus be the one to say, you'll be with me in paradise. We're just we're simply to point them to him right right and that's the that's the danger you know as a pastor that's the danger that's that that all pastors face and wrestle with is is trying desperately and hopefully hopefully all pastors wrestle with this uh trying desperately to make sure that the ministry built at the church that they have been entrusted with is christ-centered and is not built on the personality or abilities of the pastor Mm-hmm. It is built because when the pastor leaves, then it continues because it's all about Jesus. It's mm-hmm. not about, you know, Kip's vision. Um, and so that that's an important element of, of ministry is, and in, in, in even if you're not a pastor, is that what you're doing as a Bible worker and what you're doing as a as an elder and a, a lay minister is to point to Jesus. That's it. Yeah. You know, and it's not about me. And sometimes we make it about us and we go, oh, yeah, yeah, it's not about me. <laughs> well, we need to make sure and let the Spirit be the one to actually bring that deep conviction as opposed to us saying, come on, just have conviction. We're, we're just supposed to point to right. and then and then the Spirit goes to work. Sure. And and th- th- that's one thing that I re- very much appreciated about um, uh, Gary Park's ministry as the relational uh, ministry director for the conference and he does the disc task and he does emotional maturity and all of that and he came down to the gateway and did a portion of that and he's going to come back i think in october uh and i think he's coming to grants pass soon is is that we begin to understand e- e- each other's context and so uh you know i'm an i and he said well you know the eyes a lot of people say say that eyes have to be the center of attention and always you know looking for a compliment and he said but that's where they find out if they're doing okay hmm. it's not you know because it's like well, i don't think i'm egotistical but you know it is it is helpful to hear encouragement so that i can keep the energy going um and uh i'm just comfortable making sure that people are happy and and that sometimes makes me feel like well, I'm the center of attention, but not because I want the attention. I just need to make sure things are happening. And so that's my personality. And he put those in words that I go, oh, okay, I get it. Because sometimes you you, you say, I need to be more of a wallflower, but that's not my personality. Mm-hmm. So anyway, uh, we are going to go to our break, and then we're going to get to verse 17 finally. We'll be back right after this. Thank you for listening to Catching the Light. We pray you're being blessed and encourage you to contact us with your questions and comments. You can reach us by email at radio at betterlifetv.tv. That's radio at betterlifetv.tv. Or visit us at betterlifetv.tv slash catching the light. That's betterlifetv.tv slash catching the light. Or simply call us at 541-474-3089. It's our sincere desire that you'll be blessed while studying the Word of God with us here on Catching the Light. Catching the Light is listener-supported. To become a financial partner, visit our website or write to us at P.O. Box 766, Grants Pass, Oregon, 97528. That's P.O. Box 766, Grants Pass, Oregon, 97528. Uh, welcome back to Catching the Light. Uh, we are finally getting what we spent the first 15 minutes talking about uh, one verse and talking all the way around the verse and then maybe had a rabbit trail or two. So <laughs> anyway, but it's okay. It's all good. Um, let's begin in chapter 20, verse 17. And this is the third time that Jesus speaks of his death and his resurrection. And so when I read this and I think, man, the disciples still didn't get it. And it, 
to me, it's so plain. It's so clear what he's trying to say here. Uh, and so let me go ahead and read that. It's uh, 17 through 19. It says, Now Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the 12 disciples aside on the road and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed to the chief priests and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles to mock, to mock and to scourge and to crucify. And the third day he will rise again. Do, do you think that the, that the disciples in their thickness, you know, spiritual things are spiritually discerned. Um, I'm pretty sure without a spiritual mind, and I read that, I might understand it um, if somebody told me that. Do you think maybe the disciples still just weren't clear on when Jesus said Son of Man who he was talking about? I think the, a lot of it has to do with the fact that the, they had been for generations under, uh, understanding that when the Messiah comes, he's going to bring in a physical kingdom and he's going to exalt Israel to be that um, top nation um, that all their nations are going to look up to and stuff and going to, and they're going to be basically ruling over the world. And so because if you've been indoctrinated with that from generation, 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 you know, that's pretty well seated in your mind. And so for Jesus to say these things, I'm sure there must have been some confusion to him. That what, what's he talking about here? Because remember in another place when he says that, because uh, this, my little subheading says, Jesus a third time predicts his, <clears throat> his death and resurrection. Remember there's another time where he does it and he, Peter takes him and shakes him. No, Lord, this will never happen to you. Because it, it, for them, it was hard for them to conceive that Jesus was not going to be with there all time. Okay, so it's a process of denial. And and I think that um, um, number one, um, I, I think this is this is the way Jesus taught on earth. But I think this is the way God teaches us. If you look at throughout the Word, the Word tends to take certain principles, packages it slightly different. And then we can see that the principle is repeated in various aspects of, of the Bible. So, so God teaches very much on that repetition so that our little, and of course, I think he understands the human mind under sin <laughs> doesn't really always work all that well. And, and we need over and over and over and over and over again. But God doesn't want us to be ignorant. And, and one thing, there, there's, a, there's a phrase that I like, there's many things we need to learn. And there's many more things we need to unlearn, hmm. and and I think that uh, that this is this is part of that that too. Listen, you think of of the Messiah as this big deliverer from the Roman oppression and all this stuff like that, but um, you need to understand that yes, there's going to be deliverance, but it's going to look completely different. So you need to understand it. So th- now this is the third time that he's trying to get them to understand what it is that his mission re- really is. Um, and, you know, we're, we're, you, you use, you've been using the word thick. Well, very much thick in the head, for okay. sure. <laughs> Why do you think uh, that Christ, knowing all things, knowing that they just still weren't getting it, knowing that they were, they were burdened, they were weighed down with uh, the generations of their expectations, why do you think Jesus didn't sit, sit them down and just say, look, you're not getting it. <laughs> this isn't what it's about. It's, it's, it's about the kingdom to come, the kingdom within. It is not about the kingdom of rule here and now. Why do you think Jesus didn't do that? You know, I, I, I wish I had an answer for that. <laughs> I don't, except for that. I, I think maybe Jesus recognized it was demonstration more than um, giving them logic, you know, or uh, um, yeah, the step-by-step process of what he really was there for. And because, you know, again, he said three, three times and they still haven't gotten it yet. And so uh, the, me, I go to seeing the upper room experience when he puts aside him, his uh, main robe and stuff and he grabs the towel and he gets down and washes their feet. And I, I love that picture because it's like a picture is worth a thousand words. I can tell them that I'm going to die and that, you know, my kingdom isn't of the physical world and stuff, but I'm going to do it. The one that they call master, I mean, remember, Peter doesn't even want him to touch him at all because like, no, you're never going to do this to me, master. You're the master. I should be doing this to you. And so I just love the picture that he paints there in the upper room when he shows this is what my kingdom is really all about. It's serving others. It's humbling yourself. It's lifting up others instead of lifting up yourself. Mm-hmm. I, I think um, my uh, speaking to my teenage son, 
kind of comes to mind. <laughs> because because I I have I have said some things and I and I've just looked over to Lana and I was just like I don't think it got anywhere. <laughs> he didn't get it. But it was very interesting. There was one time he was talking to this friend. This friend was whatever, and I hear him. He's on his phone and and I hear him saying some things. And then I hear that he he kind of got off the phone and I just stuck my head around the corner and I was like, what did you just say to your friend? And he's like, I said, da, 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 da. And I went, where'd you hear that from? And he's like, you dad. <laughs> and, and so, and so I, I think, and, and so if, if, and the way I approach it is, you know what? Hey, here, here's this, here's this, here's this. Didn't appear like he heard it whatsoever. It didn't seem like he applied it to his life. But when he was talking to this friend who was going through a certain whatever, um, he shared verbatim what I had said to him maybe a, a few weeks before. And of course, being the dad who I am, I had to pop my head around the corner and say, where'd you hear that from? <laughs> um, but, it, you know, so so at at times we we need and um, it I'll guarantee you it wasn't the first time I had talked to him about whatever that principle happened to be. And so this this definitely reminds me of that's that's oftentimes what we need is to have something where not only is it taught, but it's taught in a way um, Jesus seemed to teach and then step back and then let the Holy Spirit make the application happen. Mm -hmm. So I, I, you know, there, there are other instances in scripture where I said, well, why didn't Jesus just say that more clearly? You know, the, the disciples, what, two or three times m mistook Jesus as a ghost and Jesus never clarified what ghosts are. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and I'm like, well, why didn't Jesus just say, you know, stop thinking about ghosts? You know, it's either an evil spirit or it's, you know, he, he didn't clarify that. Uh, Jesus could have easily spoke to the Sabbath issue in a, in a larger way that would have more impact on, on our Christian cultures today. Um, and he didn't do that. And, 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 and here he didn't do that. And I think that, that, in this place, a little bit off of what you were saying, Sean, is is I believe that that I use this expression: uh, we yield in cooperation. We yield in cooperation. And we, you know, I used to always say we yield, and I go, wait, but the the element I bring is to cooperate with that, right? Mm -hmm. Is that God wants us to process? Mm -hmm. If you just tell me, bump, 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 you know, two plus two is four. When I get the test, I will do that. But if you don't show me two pies plus two pies on the sheet and start to let me process the visual of that and and work it through this mind that God has given me, that 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 then I'm just going to parrot something and it's not going to be personal. And does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. I, I think that um, so we have we have two different sides to our brain. The the left brain is the, the data or the logic side. I just have a front and a back. I don't have a side. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there's, there's the left brain. So if, you know, I, I, I can, I can read these verses to you and that would just go to the, the left brain. It would just be a whole bunch of data that I could share with you. But if in fact it can be allowed to sink in and then the Lord through the spirit gives me application it switches from left brain which is data right brain is where it becomes more of an actual heartfelt that's where the heart would be or the emotional response or a practical application so the practical application is not from left brain um, how it goes into to reality and becomes part of me and my life that's going to be more the right brain and sometimes it takes a little while for it to go from data to application Mm -hmm. and, and so, so, and God made us. Mm -hmm. And so he, he understands that at times what you need is to be given this little bit of this, and then we start to process it. And then it actually becomes something that we go, ping, and then we, we say, And then okay. you got it forever. Yes. Yes. So, so case in point, you know, when Chuck, you went to college, do you remember everything you were taught in college? Very little. Right. Because you, you learned just enough to 
put it on the test mm -hmm. and get through the class. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was building my, we, Denise and I built the log home on the coast before we moved out here a few years before um, and then sold it. But when I, uh, we built, did almost all the construction <coughs> ourselves um, and I had to build these exposed rafters, um, which was in itself hard because math isn't the way my brain works. So, you know, you have your run and your rise and you have to make a bird's mouth and you get the angles just right. And then, you know, there's a lot of calculation and figuring there. Um, by the time I got them all built, they were pretty. They were pretty. Well, then I was going to make my stairs and I had to make my, so I thought, well, you know, the short stairs are going from the garage into the house. That's like three steps. But then the big stairs go to the second floor. So I'll start with the little ones. And I built those things because it's the same, same concept, run and rise. But now you have treads. And so I built them and they were wrong. And a pet peeve of mine is if somebody builds them wrong and the first step is short, they aren't all the same. And that's what happens. And I built it. And I thought, oh, man, I did that wrong. So I thought it through and I built it again. Oh, I did that wrong. Um, and after the second time of not getting it right, I thought, well, I'm just going to clean. So push a broom, clean up so it's easier to work when your workspace is clean. And during that time, I was able to process it. And during that time, as as it got to, you know, I'm just thinking about it. I'm not even thinking about it hard. All of a sudden, I had this aha moment. And I go, oh, I'm doing it wrong because I'm forgetting one step. And I had to deduct the thickness of the tread from the from the top or the bottom. I forget exactly now. But I, I it, it's now part of me in the sense that it wouldn't take me very long to figure out how to build a step again. Because now it is, it is, it has moved, as you said, from one side of my brain to the other side of my brain. Um, and I, and, and Jesus knows this. And so, uh, as we move forward and we, we read things that we don't understand, he says, yeah, I'm not going to say real clearly, but, but when you take the, this word as a whole and pray on it and meditate on it and let the spirit of God influence you on it, it will become deeper and more meaningful and, and more impactful in your life. Mm -hmm. Than for me just to say, well, this is that 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 and move on. And and yeah, go ahead. Say, and and we grow um, by our mistakes sometimes if we're willing to learn from them, you know. And so I know that um, you know. I remember when I uh, put my first ceiling fan in. Well, my only ceiling fan where they had the fan, you know, and the light and everything. And uh, I uh, I'm not naturally me uh, it would call it me mechanically mechanical inclined person. Yeah. And so, uh, but I did it. It took me like three hours because I I I oh. I forgot, I can't put the wires in yet. I got to do this and this. But now I told my wife, I said, you know what? I have to do it again. I probably could do it in an hour and a half, maybe less. Because I, you learn from mistakes. And so, you, like you said, you learn to process. Mm -hmm. so. so what kind of mistakes have we learned from personally in our spiritual life? And why don't we learn from our mistakes? We've just got a minute left. So why mm -hmm. don't we learn from our mistakes? Let's ask that question. Because we enjoy doing what we enjoy doing. Okay. And we're not willing to learn. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it hurts to have to think that I made a mistake. That's true. Right. What a, a wonderful thing when we get to the point in our walk where we can say, you know what? I messed up. That's on me. Yeah. Lord, forgive me. Amen. And grow me. We'll see you next time here on Catching the Light.